Genesis chapter 6, and we'll only be reading verses 1 through 8, right? Good. And uh, please stand once you find it for the reading of God's word. All right. And it came to pass, when men began to multiply in the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh. Yet his days shall be an a hundred and twenty years. There were giants in the earth in those days, and also, and also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men which were of old men of renown. And God saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. He said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the air, for repenteth me that I have made them. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Heavenly Father, thank you for today. We pray that you fill Brother Austin with your spirit as he delivers your word. And um, Lord, we also pray that uh, you bless the offering that we're about to receive also. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Things are always a little different when pastor's away with the order of services and everything, but... <laughs> All right, well, there in uh, Genesis chapter number six, and um, the title of my sermon this morning is Defining Repentance. Defining Repentance. Now, um, this word repent is something that comes up quite frequently in the Bible. In fact, um, according to my Strong's Concordance, uh, accordance 111 times. And um, it, my, it was my original goal while writing the sermon to uh, visit every single time the word was used in the Bible, but it would just take so long that we would probably be here until uh, evening service, but um, so we won't do that tonight, but or this morning rather, but um, some form of that word repent, repent, repentance, repented, repentest, repenteth, repenting, and repentings, um, 111 times if you look it up in the Bible, and um, the reason why I decided to preach on this is um, Sometimes you have to define terms and what you're talking about. Oftentimes when we're, we're out soul winning, I'll often ask the question to somebody um, when we talk about believing on Jesus Christ for salvation. I'll ask them, you know, what do you think that word means, the word believe, and ask them, hey, can you give me a quick definition? Because if believing is what you have to do to be saved, then you better understand what that word means. And the word repentance, um, because it's used so frequently in the Bible and it's, it's brought up so much, uh, we need to understand what it means because I found that there's um, a lot of misunderstanding behind that word in the Bible. And uh, some of the things that people often think it means, some of the, the phrases they'll give you if you ask them for a definition of repentance, they'll say um, asking for forgiveness, right? Um, they'll say uh, turning away from sin, uh, a change of mind. A reformation in lifestyle or uh, getting right with God, right? Those are some of the uh, things that people think of when they hear the word repent. And we're going to go through, um, I picked out a few uh, scriptures that I think very de well demonstrate uh, the proper usage of this word and what it means. And we're there in uh, Genesis chapter 6. If you look down at um, verse number 5 there, it says, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And look at verse 6. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. So the first time that the word repent is ever used in the Bible, it's in the context of God repenting. And uh, I have this split up into two different sections. Part one is we're going to talk about the times that God repents in the Bible. And like I said, this is the first mention of the word. And if you look at the context here, we can kind of figure out what it means when it talks about it repented the Lord that he had made man. And then uh, down in verse 7 towards the end, he says, For it repenteth me that I, I have made them. And so if we kind of think back to what some of the common um, 
phrases are that people think about what repentance means. Well, is it um, asking for forgiveness here? Did, does God need to be forgiven because he made man? You know, certainly not. Is it a turning away from sin? Well, God has no sin, so it can't be that. Is it a change of mind, right? A lot of people think, well, well God changed his mind here. And um, In fact, the new versions of the Bible, such as like the NIV, the ESV, and and those, those type of things will, will change the word repent here, and they'll switch it to regret, like it, God regretted that he had made man. But the issue I have with that is that when you think about things that you regret in life, it's usually something wrong that you did, isn't it? Like, you know, hey, I regretted that decision I made. Well, that means it was a bad decision. And so the question is, does God make bad decisions? <clears throat> Read, um, read uh, Deuteronomy chapter 32. Go ahead and turn there, just a few books to the right. And we'll see. Because oftentimes you'll ask people about this verse, and they'll say, well, God changed his mind in a sense that, you know, he had made man, and then he regretted it or, you know, felt sorry about it. But uh, you're there in Deuteronomy chapter 32. Look down at verse number 4. The Bible says, He is the rock. His work is perfect. For all His ways are judgment. A God of truth and without iniquity. Just and right is He. They they have corrupted themselves. Their spot or their spot is not the spot of His children. They are perverse and crooked generation. So in verse 4 He says, His work is perfect. The work that the Lord made was perfect. In fact, in Genesis chapter 1, uh, God looks out on his creation, he says, and he saw that it was good. And it's not that God's work was wrong, like he had made a bad decision with creating man or anything, but it's that we, you know, went out of the way and corrupted ourselves. So what does this word here in uh, Genesis chapter 6 mean? It repented the Lord. And I think a key, a key word in that uh, verse is grieved. If you turn back there real quick to Genesis 6, the our main our main text. And I think that kind of the idea of the word here and its usage is, you know, to be, you know, grieved or to be kind of mournful about it. And in fact, if you look up in uh, the Webster's Dictionary, I like uh, using the 1828 because um, he was kind of constructed to define Bible words. Um, not only my King James only, I'm Webster's only, I'm just kidding. But, um, but it says that he, in uh, verse number six, it says it grieved him at his heart, and that's and that's what I think um, the main takeaway is here is that when God looked out and he saw that he was going to have to destroy man from off the off the face of the earth, it's not that he he made a bad decision or you know he necessarily changed his mind in a way because the Bible says in uh, Malachi chapter three verse six, for I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore, ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. And then in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8, he says, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever. So it's clear that God remains the same, you know, and what that's referring to is God's character. You know, who God is is never going to change. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Uh, The Lord God Almighty, back in Genesis 6, he's the same as he is today. So when it repented the Lord that he made man, Right? It grieved him. And we know, of course, God can be grieved. God can be, we can even make God sad. Um, think of what, what's like the most famous verse in the Bible, or one of the most famous verses in the Bible, because it's so short that the Sunday school kids love to quote it. Jesus wept, right? And it talks about the groaning that Jesus had when he went upon the tomb of Lazarus. Then in uh, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30, it says, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. So we're not supposed to grieve the Holy Spirit of God. And uh, the word grieve, it's the same word as we saw in Genesis chapter 6. So we can make God, you know, um, you know, grieve in in that way. We can make him, you know, kind of mournful or sorrowful because of our sins and, you know, turning away from him. And so that first time that we see the word repent, it's not a a turning away from sin, obviously, because... Because God has no sin. Um, But we'll go to uh, Exodus chapter 32 now. And we'll look at another mention of God repenting. Exodus chapter 32. 
And when you get there, look down at verse number 10. <clears throat> now therefore, let me alone, that my wrath may wax hot against them, and that I may consume them. And I will make of thee a great nation. And Moses besought the Lord his God, and said, Lord, why doth thy wrath, why doth thy wrath wax hot against thy people, which thou hast brought forth? out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand. Wherefore should the Egyptians speak and say, For mischief did he bring them out to slay them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth. Turn from thy fierce wrath and repent of this evil against thy people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, thy servants to whom thou swearest by thine own self, and saidst unto them, I will multiply your seed as the stars of heaven and all this land that I have spoken while I give unto your seed, and they shall inherit it forever. And notice verse 14, And the Lord repented of the evil which he thought to do unto the people. So th this word repent is used two times in this passage. Uh, the first is um, Moses praying to God, and he says, Repent of this evil against thy people. And the context of this passage, obviously, is they just made the golden calf, and so you know, God's thinking about just wiping the, these people out and starting over again with Moses. And Moses makes an intercessory prayer, right, and uh, calls upon God and, you know, turn away from thy fierce wrath. And that's a key word, I think, to understand repentance in this context is turn, right, or to change, of course, of action. Now, I often think of, like, the story of um, David and Bathsheba after David commits that sin, and then God tells him that he's going to judge him by right, the child dying, and the whole time before his, his baby dies, you know, he's praying to God, um, and then, of course, the baby dies, and he, he takes off the sackcloth and ashes, and he says, you know, who knows whether or not God will be merciful, so, you know, we can pray to God, um, and oftentimes, and we can demonstrate this story after story in the Bible, where, well, God will actually change his course of action, and um, go a different route. And you say, well, didn't it say back in Malachi that the Lord changes not? It does say that, but that's referring to, you know, God's character and his person, You're right? Everything about who God is. So we see that, you know, Moses, he prays that he will, you know, turn from his fierce wrath, and the Lord repented in of the evil. And uh, go ahead and turn to Jeremiah chapter 18, and we'll look another, look up another time that, um, this word repent is used in the context of turning or a changing a course of action. Jeremiah chapter number 18. And you'll notice very quickly that God's repenting is dependent upon our actions as people or on a, a nation and what they do. If you're there in uh, Jeremiah chapter 18, look down at verse number 7. It says, At what instant I speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to pluck up and to pull down and to destroy it? If that nation against whom I pronounced turn from their evil, I will repent of the evil that I thought to do unto them. And at what instant I shall speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to build and to plan it, if it do evil in my sight, that it obey not my voice, then I will repent of the good wherewith I said I would benefit them. And so we see in here that God lays out an if-then right, scenario. He says, if that nation whom I pronounced evil turn from their evil, right, I will repent. And then in verse number 9, he says, at one instance I shall speak concerning a nation to build it and to pluck it up. It says, if it do evil in my sight, then he says, then I will repent of the good that I thought to do unto them. So we see that repent in this context simply means to, you know, have a change of direction, right? I will do this to you if you do evil, but then if the people turn from their evil ways as a nation, then God's going to repent and do good to them. And the same thing's true if the people are doing good and then they turn and start doing evil, God says, I'm going to repent of the good that I thought to do unto them. And once again, this isn't God changing um, his personality or anything, because uh, he's already laid out, right, his, his um, conditions for blessing and cursing a nation back in Deuteronomy, right? You have, um, I think it's Mount Ebal, 
Mount Ebal and Mount Gerzim, where it's like the Mount of Blessing and the Mount of Cursing, and then he spends a whole chapter, like the first few verses are talking about the blessings, and then like the last like 60 verses or something are all the curses that are going to come upon a nation, and he's, it's a it's an if-then situation, and um, we see that here in, in Jeremiah. So very quickly, we're, we're finding out that the word repent, it has a lot more than just, a lot more meaning than just, you know, turn from a wicked lifestyle or asking for forgiveness for something, because that's not how the word is used in the majority of the Old Testament. And I know we've been in the Old Testament the whole time, but we'll, we'll get to the New Testament eventually here. But go ahead and turn to Numbers chapter 23. Numbers chapter 23. And we're going to look at the type of repenting that God's not going to do. Numbers 23. And uh, this is the story of Balaam, how he's you know, supposed to curse the, the nation of Israel. And... Uh, this is Balaam talking, if you look down in verse 18, and he says, And he took up his parable and said, Rise up, Balak, and hear, hearken unto me, thou son of Zippor. God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. Hath he said, and shall he not do it? Or hath he spoken, and shall he not make it good? And so he's saying here that you know, God's not a man that he should lie, nor the son of man that he should repent. So in this context, he's saying God's not going to repent. And you, you might be saying, well, this is Balaam talking, and he wasn't a very good guy in the Bible. And, and that's true, but we'll confirm what he says with um, the prophet Samuel. So go ahead and turn to 1 Samuel chapter 15, and we'll see almost the same wording here as in the book of Numbers. First Samuel chapter 15. So God's repentance is um, a change of course of action, um, kind of a, a sorrowing, and uh, the type of repentance that he's not going to do is lie or go back on his word and what he said. Um, in Titus chapter 1 it says, um, In hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the, before the world began. And in Hebrews chapter 6, verse 8, it says, It is impossible for God to lie. So we can take all of God's promises as yea and amen, the Bible teaches, and in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. So God's promised us eternal life, and that's a great, uh, that's one of my favorite verses, especially when, when preaching the gospel to people, is that, you know, God's promised you that eternal life. And as we see in the Bible, it, he cannot lie and he cannot repent in the sense of that, of going back on his word. And you're there in 1 Samuel chapter number 15. Look down at verse number 29. It says, And also the strength of Israel will not lie nor repent. And notice how strength is capitalized there. It's talking about God. Will not lie nor repent. For he is not a man that he should repent. So we see Samuel basically um, brings up the same uh, lingo as what Balaam was using back in the book of Numbers. And so that kind of confirms that doctrine that obviously God's not going to go back on his, on his promise. And when God pronounces something like he's pronouncing on Saul here, he says, it's, it's going to happen. There's nothing you can do about it because God's not a man that he shall lie nor repent. So repentance... It doesn't mean to, to change your mind like on a promise. If uh, you promise somebody to do something for them and then uh, you lie about that and like go back on it, right? That's not, that's not repenting. I guess that is turning from a, um, what you were going to say, but that would repenting to do you know, wrong, of course. But, um, so we looked at, at God repenting, but, and that's actually, if you look it up, the majority of the time that the word is used, it's actually in context of the Lord. And the problem is, and some of the confusion, is that um, the modern versions of the Bible, or you know, like we, we like to call them you know, perversions of the Bible, because they make a lot of changes and they're, they're translated from corrupted text and such, that they completely remove the word repent 
whenever God repents, but then they'll leave it in when man's repenting. And we're going to look at why I believe that's, that's such a problem, and it, it's so confusing, because a lot of times when people hear the word repentance, they always think, they always tag on this phrase afterward, of your sin, right? Repent of your sin. And you'll ask them, what does the re word repent mean? It means to repent of your sin. And, well, that doesn't make sense, because if the word repent means to turn from sin, then you don't have to say repent of your sin. And a lot of our, there's um, a few songs in our hymnal, you know, really popular ones like Victory in Jesus, where it talks about, then I repented of my sin and, and won the victory, or the old account was settled, right, where he says, O sinner, seek the Lord, repent of all your sin, for thus he hath commanded, if you would enter in. And it's like, did he really command that? Because let me give you a hint that the phrase repent of your sins is never used in the Bible one time. And, you know, that's, that's a shocker to some people because, you know, we hear that phrase so much and it's on gospel tracks. And, uh, I mean, many people use that phrase when they're in their gospel presentation. And um, I believe very strongly that they're, that they're wrong to do so. And we're going to get in a little bit talking about uh, man repenting and, and why I think that. And go ahead and turn to Exodus chapter number 13. And by the way, um, a book that does contain the phrase, repent of your sins, is the Book of Mormon. And it, it's, it's kind of funny, if you look it up in there, um, if you didn't know this, this is just a side note, but that it's a very racist book um, and it, from its time because uh, I was with a brother and we were hanging out at Half Price Books, just going in there to uh, look around, and he pulled out a Book of Mormon. He's like, hey, brother, check this verse out. And it's like, I forget the reference in there. I don't care to remember it, but it, it, ta it talks about like, I fear my brethren, unless you shall repent of your sins, like their skins will be whiter than yours. So it's like if you're if you don't repent of all your sin, like you're gonna have like a darker skin tone or everything. It's just it's really weird, and uh, I'm glad the Bible doesn't you know have that kind of junk in it. <laughs> but you're there in um, Exodus chapter number 13. Look at verse number 17. And it came to pass, when Pharaoh had let the people go, that God led them not through the way of the land of the Philistines, although that way was near. For God said, Lest peradventure the people repent when they see war, and they turn back to Egypt. But God led the people about through the way of the wilderness of the Red Sea, and the children of Israel went up harnessed out of the land of Egypt. So um, verse, verse 17 there is key, where God says, Lest peradventure... The people repent when they see war. That's why he didn't lead them through the way of the Philistines. So they're coming out of Egypt, right? And he, he takes them a little bit, you know, an easier direction where they're not going to have war just, you know, right off the bat because they're going to have, they're going to repent and say, well, you know, we don't want to deal with this. We're just going to go back to Egypt. So it's interesting that in this context of, of man repenting, it actually would be bad if they repented. It, they would repent towards doing wrong and says, God, God says, I don't want them to repent, lest peradventure the people repent. So we see here that repentance is just to change, right, and to have a, a change of a, a course of action, right? And God, in this, in this instance, did not want them to repent. So that's, that's a definition that's applicable here to, it's just to change or to turn, right? You could say, I was I was going to um, Iowa Baptist Temple, but the weather was really bad in January, so I repented and went home, right? That would be repenting towards doing wrong, right? I'm just kidding. But um, turn to Matthew chapter 3. I promised we'd, we'd get into the Gospels here. And we're going to look at John the Baptist. And probably some of the most famous scriptures about repentance are in the Gospel accounts. Matthew chapter number 3, and this is the famous um, John the Baptist preaching the baptism of repentance. It says in verse number 1 of chapter 3, it says, In those days came John the Baptist, preaching in the wilderness of Judea, and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. And the same John had his raiment of camel's hair and a leathern girdle about his loins, and his meat was locust and wild honey. And they went out to him, and, and they went out to him, Jerusalem, and all Judea, 
and all the region round about Jordan, and were baptized of them in Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, O O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring forth therefore fruits, meat for repentance. And think not to say within yourselves, We have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. And now also the axe is laid unto the root of the trees. Therefore every tree which bringeth forth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. So a few times in this, this uh, passage, the word repent is brought up. In verse 2 he says, All right, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Bring forth therefore fruits, meat for repentance. And he talks about baptizing people unto repentance. And when you're looking at a passage like this, and it's brought up so many different times, it can kind of sometimes be a little bit confusing on all right, trying to figure out what it means. And I preached a message a while ago called um, right, Temptation in the Bible, I think. And there's a very similar, that's a very similar word because um, tempt can have a few different definitions as well, where it says like God will not tempt man, or, or God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. And then you look it back in, in uh, Genesis, where it says God tempted Abraham. And that could be kind of a, a seemingly a contradiction. But what you have to understand is that in languages, certain words can have like multiple different meanings, depending on the context in which they're used. And repentance is, is definitely the same thing. So when we're looking at um, the baptism of repentance here, and we're trying to figure out what John the Baptist is talking about, it's very convenient that the Bible gives us a commentary on what John was preaching. And uh, that's given to us in Acts chapter 19, if you would uh, flip over in your Bibles there to Acts chapter 19. And we're going to see exactly what it was that he was saying when he was preaching that. Because a lot of people, they'll turn to these types of passages and try to preach a works-based salvation, right? He said, well, John said, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That means in order to go to heaven, you have to clean up your life and, uh, you know, start going to church and praying and, and doing this whole big laundry list of commandments, right? And that's, and that's kind of the one misconceptions about what that, the word repent means is to, like, to turn from sin. And so they have that in their mind that it just means to turn from sin. And then they'll just apply it to like every single passage that it comes up. But we're going to see what John was, was um, saying when uh, he was preaching the baptism of repentance. Look down at verse number 1 in Acts chapter 19. And it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus. And finding certain disciples, he said unto them, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? And they said unto him, We have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. And he said unto them, Unto what then were you baptized? And they said, Unto John's baptism. Then said Paul, John verily baptized, verily baptized with the baptism of repentance. And this is key right here. Saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him. That is, on Christ Jesus. So John's message, his, his baptism of repentance, his, um, his whole goal was uh, prophesied back even in Isaiah, prepare you the way of the Lord. He was preparing people for the coming of Jesus Christ and you know, saying, repent ye, basically, to turn towards Christ. And these people in Acts chapter 19, like, they were baptized in John's repentance, but when Paul's asked them about the Holy Ghost, they're like, we don't even know. And then... And then in verse 4, then they actually get, like, re or Sorry, in verse 5, it says, When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. So they actually get re-baptized there um, in a Father, Son, Holy Ghost baptism. But John's baptism of repentance, he wasn't telling people necessarily to, you know, start living a good life and trying to keep the law to go to heaven, right? That wasn't the message at all. That's actually the opposite of what he was preaching. He was turning people towards Jesus Christ and in his message. And that's, that's, that's all John's uh, mission was, right? If, like in, back in the Old Testament where it prophesies about him multiple times, right? He's preparing the way of the Lord. And so we see in this, um, 
context, repentance is a change of mind, right, towards believing on Christ. And we're going to look at a few more uh, cases where I believe that's, that's, um, that's true. But don't get it in your head that I'm, I'm saying that repentance isn't required for salvation at all. But we have to define what kind of repentance we're talking about because the word repent is definitely used in salvation um, scriptures. And if you would, go ahead and turn to Second Peter chapter 3. Right, there's, there's two extremes when we look at this um, repentance debate, because it's been going on for a long time, even amongst independent Baptists, where uh, people will have that phrase, repent of your sins in the gospel track, and then someone will right, pre pre preach against it really hard, do an extreme, and, and say, well, no, no repentance is ever required at all for salvation. But in Second uh, Peter, there in... Verse num or chapter number 3, look at verse 9. He says, The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So, God, He's not willing that any should perish, right? Meaning, go to hell, right, for their sins. But He says, but that all, should, all men should come to repentance. And I love quoting this passage um, to people because it shows that, right, God wants everybody to be saved. He doesn't want anybody to go to hell. And, but notice that the opposite of perishing is repenting here. And, okay, well, well what does that mean? Is it, is it required for salvation? But in, in this context, yes, but it doesn't mean to to change over a lifestyle, right? Turn over a new leaf and start trusting in your works to get you into heaven. That's not at all what it means. We'll go to um, Mark chapter 1, and we'll look at a few more cases where it's in context of personal salvation to get an idea of what, what type of repentance we're talking about here. Because sometimes it is, right, changing... Um, towards doing good works. For instance, and um, we're not going to go there, but in the book of Acts, in the, sto the story of Simon the sorcerer, right, he gets saved, and then he sees the apostles, right, performing miracles, and, and he says, and he tries to purchase the gift of the Holy Ghost from them, and he's rebuked very harshly, and it's a, and they say, repent of this thy wickedness. So it 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 can be used. Uh, to, to preach like a, a turn from your wickedness, but when in, it's in context of preaching about salvation, you know that's that's not what it's talking about because salvation is just by faith alone in Jesus Christ. And there, there in Mark chapter one, let's look down at verse number fourteen. Now after that, John was put in prison. Jesus came into Galilee, preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God, and saying. The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. He says, repent ye, and believe the gospel. So, when Jesus is preaching about the gospel of the kingdom, he says, repent ye, and believe the gospel. Right? To have a change of, either a change of mind or a change of your heart towards believing in Jesus Christ and his gospel. And uh, just turn a couple pages to your right to Mark chapter 6. And uh, we'll read verse 7 and then, then skip down a few. But he says, And he called unto him the twelve, and began to send them forth send them forth by two and two, and gave them power over unclean spirits. So this is when Jesus is sending forth um, the disciples in two by two. And this is a good, uh, this is one of the reasons why out soul winning we like to have partners, because it, it's biblical to go out in pairs. And so that's kind of the context of, what, context of what's going on. And then if you skip down to verse number 12, and look what they were saying to people, and it says, And they went out and preached that men should repent. So when they were going out, and from city to city, they were, they were preaching that men should repent, right? Um, go ahead and turn to, to Luke, one book over. Luke chapter 13. And 
look down at verse number five when you get there. <clears throat> there were present at that season some that told him of the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And Jesus answering said unto them, Suppose ye that these Galileans were sinners above all the Galileans because they suffered such things? I tell you nay, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. Or those eighteen upon whom the tower in Siloam fell and slew them, think ye that they were sinners above all men that dwelt in Jerusalem? I tell you nay, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. And so what, what's going on here? Well, there's Galileans bring up the, um, they're talking about how Pilate had killed a bunch of them and mingled their blood with the sacrifices. And Jesus takes this event, and he, uh, they also mention about the Tower of Siloam uh, falling and killing 18 people, um, some sort of accident that happened back then that everybody obviously knew about. But what Jesus is doing there, he's taking these events, these physical events that happen, and applying like a spiritual message to them. Um, and he says, Suppose ye that these Galileans were sinners above all the Galileans because they suffered such things. Right? It's not that these Galileans that died in this incident, that incidents, that they were just like the worst people out there and that this was God's punishment sp specifically on them. But he says, I tell you nay, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. So in the same way that these Galileans perished right, by Pilate, he says, unless ye repent, you're, you are going to likewise perish. And this, when I was studying this out, it kind of reminded me that when you're out soul winning and you get to the part about hell in the gospel, right? Um, where, you talk, where you talk about the wages of sin is death, right? And by that point, you've already gotten the person to admit that they're a sinner. And you say, well, yeah, the wages of sin is death. And then we look at what the second death is, um, talking about hell or the lake of fire. And they say, well, hold on a minute. I'm not that bad of a person, right? You know, I'm not a sinner exceedingly, right? I'm, and what, what do they say here? He's, Jesus says, suppose you that these Galileans were sinners above all the Galileans. It's not that you have to be a sinner above all, like some really bad person, right, to go to hell. He says, and, but unless we repent, we'll all likewise perish in the same way that they did. Or even... Um, when he talks about the tower falling on the people, he says, and slew them, think ye that they were sinners above all men that dwelt in Jerusalem? He's bringing up the fact that these people weren't necessarily just like rotten individuals, but they still perished in this, in this accident. And except we repent, we are all likewise going to perish. But repent towards what? Are we, gonna, are we in fear of you know, being crushed by a tower? Well, you know, maybe, depending on what job site you work on, and I've been on some sketchy construction sites in my life, and this verse was coming to my mind, like, oh, man. <laughs> but it's, it's a spiritual application about, right, going to hell. And we need to realize that um, it's not just sinners exceeding, or we don't have to be sinners above all men to be deserving of that punishment, because we'll perish and likewise, like the people that did there. And you say, well, see, I think, I think he's, he's saying that you have to, to turn from your sin or else you're going to perish. But well, hold on a second. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8 9, it says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God. And he says, not of works, lest any man should boast. So keep that in mind when we're looking at these, these scriptures, because we've already demonstrated that repent can mean a few different things. And so if you're just going to apply that it means to, to turn or burn, then um, you're going to come away from the Bible, you know, believing in heresy, uh, frankly. But go to, uh, we'll, look at, we'll look at one more in the book of Acts, chapter 20, when he's uh, talking about repentance in regards to salvation. And the reason why I'm stressing that phrase, like, in regards to salvation, is because sometimes when the word perish or saved is used in the Bible, it's not, like, talking about, like, going to heaven. Like, when Peter steps out on the water and he starts sinking, he said, Lord, save me. He's not saying, like, take me to heaven. He's, you know, literally saved me from this water I'm about to drown in. So that's a, 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 an, it's an important distinction to make. But while you're turning to Acts 20, I'll read from you from Acts chapter 3, 3 verse 19. Or it says, Repent ye therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. And so we see that um, 
that your sins may be blotted out, right? Repent ye and be converted, be, be changed. And uh, we're there in Acts chapter number 20. Look down at verse number 17. It says, And from Miletus he sent to Ephesus, and called the elders of the church. And when they were come to him, he said unto them, Ye know, from the first day that I came into Asia, after what manner I have been with you at all seasons, serving the Lord with all humility of mind, and with many tears and temptations, which befell me and by the lying weight of the Jews. And I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but have showed you, and have taught you publicly, and from house to house, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance towards God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. So we see that this repentance towards God, it's a, it's a turning towards God and a turning towards having faith in Jesus Christ is, what, is what's being talked about here. And then in, um, in uh, Hebrews chapter 6, verse 1, it talks a little bit about the same thing. Let me turn there so I don't misquote it. Um, it says, Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God. So we see the idea of repentance in regards to personal salvation. It's, it's a change of mind and it's a change towards having your faith in Jesus Christ. You know, if somebody is uh, trusting in their works to get them into heaven, right, there's a lot of people out there that are doing that. And they think that their church attendance and, you know, their, their good works is going to get them there. Uh, we've been knocking doors around um, the Overland Park area, and there's a, this one Catholic church in particular that everybody there, they think in order to go to heaven, you have to, like, feed homeless people. And it's like, when you ask them, well, I need to, you know, I'm down there. They're like, oh, I know I'm going to heaven because I'm down there at the, the soup kitchen, and, I, you know, I really... You know, try to do the best that I can do for these people. And, like, literally, that's, that's how they know that they're going to heaven. And it's like they don't even mention anything about Jesus. But that individual needs to repent of trusting in what they're doing and change that and trust in Jesus Christ alone. That's the repentance that's required. Or you say, like, unbelief, right? Unbelief is a sin. And so people like to say, well, technically it is repenting of sin because unbelief is a sin and you have to start believing in Jesus to go say, it's like, that's not works, you know. <laughs> but someone that does have to repent of their unbelief and place their belief on Jesus Christ. I hope that makes sense. Repentance towards God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. And if you still think that, well, no, turning from your sins, it's not works, right? If, if you talk to a lot of, like, um, people that are more Pentecostal leaning and, and or charismatic, um, they also like will believe in a, a baptismal like regeneration, and they'll say, um, "All right, you have to repent of your sins, believe in Jesus, and be baptized to go to heaven." It's like, well, that's a works-based salvation. And they say, "Well, no, turning from your sins that's not works. That's that's totally separate. All right, being baptized that's not a work. That's that's totally separate." But let's look at a little bit. Let's look at one passage, um, and this will be the, the last ver verse that we turn to in the book of Jonah, chapter number 3. Got Jonah, Micah, and Nahum. Jonah chapter 3, and uh, we'll start reading in verse 5, where it says, So the people of Nineveh believed God, and proclaimed a fast, and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them, even to the least of them. For the word, of the, Lord, for the word came unto the king of Nineveh, and he rose from his throne, and he laid his robe from him, and covered him with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. And he caused it to be proclaimed and published, through Nineveh, by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed nor drink water. But let man and beast be covered with sackcloth, and cry mightily unto God. Yea, let them turn every one from his evil way, and from the violence that is in their hands. Who can tell if God will turn and repent, and turn away from his fierce anger, that we perish not? 
Verse 10 is, is one of my favorites. It says, And God saw their works that they turned from their evil way, and God repented of the evil that he said that he would do unto them, and he did it not. And I think if anybody's confused about this subject, Jonah chapter 3, verse 10 is the best verse that you could possibly turn to. Because not only does it show that it says God repented of the evil they said unto them, but look at the first part of verse 10. It says, And God saw their works that they turned from their evil way. So turning from your evil way is works. And that's a good thing to do, right? We should all be repenting of sins daily. But if you're going to teach that someone has to repent of their sins, right, turn over a new leaf for salvation, then you're preaching a works-based salvation. And let me be very clear, because I know good people that, that, you, that say that, repent of your sins, and they'll have it in their gospel tracts and everything, and um, these men are saved. And, um, but when you, when you, you kind of pinpoint them down on the issue, they'll say, well, I'm just, I just mean, like, admit you're a sinner or something. But that's not, that's not what that phrase means. Repent of sin means to, to turn from sin. And we see that, that very plainly, that God defines that as works here in Jonah chapter 3. God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way. And this is in context of Nineveh, the city of Nineveh, repenting at the preaching of Jonah. And we looked at that um, verse back in Jeremiah where it talks about, right, we looked at the if-then scenario, like if this people, right, start doing good, then God's going to repent of the evil that he said he would do. And then if they start doing evil, he's going to repent of the good. And we see that play out here. And what we have to understand is that nations don't go to heaven, you know. It's not like uh, the President Biden can get up and just say, all right, everybody, everybody's turning to the Lord and uh, everybody's going to get saved. Like that wouldn't save anybody, you know. And look, that would never happen, by the way. You know, there's no way. But even if it did, in theory, okay, maybe God would start blessing the United States more and, you know, save us from um, his wrath, from turning away from him. But, you know, when it comes to personal salvation, it's not a, a turning away from our sin that's going to save us. It's a turning away from our unbelief, our turning away from anything that we were trusting in to get us into heaven, and just faith alone on Jesus Christ. So, in conclusion there, um, we just ask ourselves, like, what does repentance mean? And um, I'm sorry, we weren't able to turn to, to more verses because, like I said, there's just so many times that it's used. And uh, we can think about um, the times where Jesus talks about, right, um, forgiving your brother. And it talks about, you know, him coming and repenting seven times in a day. And he says every time, you know, do that. So in that context, it's about, like, him, right, that person asking for forgiveness from you when he's, he's being repentant. Or then we can think of in Revelation where he has the, the messages to the seven churches and he's, he's constantly telling them to repent, right, and start doing the first works. Repent, repent, repent. Basically, in that context, right, getting right and, and stop going, you know, stop doing the things, some of the things you are doing and go back to the first works. And then um, I believe it's 2 Corinthians chapter number 7 where Apostle Paul, he uses the word like, half a dozen times in like the space of like three verses and you're like what in the world is he saying he's like I do repent but I don't repent I repented I didn't repent you're like what I thought did you or didn't you repent but the thing is and uh, let's just turn there actually real quick Second Corinthians chapter number 7 because it's we'll leave you on a confusing verse and you can ask Pastor Randall when he gets back I believe it's 2 Corinthians chapter number 7. Yeah, verse number 6. Nevertheless, God that comforteth those that are cast down comforted us by the coming of Titus, and not by his coming only, but by the consolation wherewith he was comforted in you, when he told us your earnest desire, your mourning, and your fervent mind toward me, so that I rejoiced the more. For though I made you sorry with a letter, I do not repent, though I did repent. For I perceive that the same epistle hath made you sorry, though it were but for a season. Now I rejoice, not that you were made sorry, but that you sorrowed to repentance, for you were made sorry after a godly manner, that you might receive damage by us in nothing. But godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorry of the world 
worketh death. So godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of. And I don't think in this context he's talking about like going to heaven because uh, he's talking about the last letter that he wrote. And, and he says, you know, repentance to salvation, not to be repented of. So he's like, you're repenting towards the salvation, but the salvation, you don't want to repent of that, like turn away from that. It's like, but like I said, like he, he uses it quite a few times here. And um, it, it can be a little bit confusing if you don't understand what we just looked at and all the times that it's used in the Bible. So just to recap a little bit, you know, what does repentance mean? Well, we looked at God repenting and saw that it could, you know, um, being grieved and, and sad or uh, to change a course of action, right? And uh, we obviously know that that's not God changing necessarily, like his, his uh, person or who he is, of course, never changes. And we saw that God, the type of repentance that he doesn't do is, you know, lie or go back on a promise. He's not... Uh, he's not as man that he would repent in, in that instance. And then we looked at um, repentance on our part, what we have to do, you know, what it means for us to repent, um, also to change a course of action, right? Don't, don't go back to Egypt. And it says, um, and then the second thing we looked at was a, you know, a change of mind and a change of heart towards believing on Jesus Christ in regards to salvation. And then um, obviously this passage here in 2 Corinthians 7, which... Who knows what that's actually talking about. But um, we'll, we'll close on that note. We'll say a prayer and then um, invite Brother Zach to um, come up uh, to lead us in another song. Dear Lord, um, we just thank you for this day and uh, thank you for the opportunity to um, open your word and just um, dive in and, and do a, sort of a word study and, and figure out um, this, this important doctrine of repentance. We know that it's used... Uh, so much throughout the Bible, and we never want to misunderstand your word, and we want to be honest with um, how we quote verses and what we, what we preach to others. And so we thank you that uh, you make it super clear to us in the Bible of, of what you mean. And uh, we just pray that uh, you be with us the rest of the day as we, uh, we go out about our way and bring us back again um, safe to next service. In Jesus' name, amen.